Hi, these are the top 10 films of 1942. When I say top, I mean my personal favourite films. Cheers. In at number 10, Bambi. One of the early Disney classics. It was based on Bambi, A Life in the Woods, written by Felix Sultan. Possibly the strangest thing about it is that Sultan was an avid hunter. Disney had originally wanted it to be a live action film, and thank God they didn't attempt that. Although I'm sure if they had, Sultan would have happily shot the deer playing Bambi's mother. <laughs> In a number nine, there was a father. Another moving yet kind of upsetting film from Ozu. Ozu regular Shishu Ryu gives one of his best performances as a father with an overwhelming sense of duty. He plays a single father and teacher. He quits his job after two boys drown on a school excursion and from that day on his focus is on doing his next job perfectly and making sure his son has a good education. They have a beautiful close relationship but can't be together as Ryu is totally committed to his job. It's a very moving film, and our unhappy ending is tragically inevitable. In a number eight, one of our aircraft is missing. A great British war film from the masters Powell and Pressburger. We follow the crew of an RAF bomber who, after being shot down in Nazi-occupied Netherlands, have to try and get back to Britain. It's one of the better propaganda pieces of the period, mainly due to Powell and Pressburger being top-notch filmmakers, and that the film also tells a thrilling story. I am a little biased, as my grandmother Googie Withers plays a member of the Dutch Resistance, but she is fantastic in the role, and strangely enough, her Dutch mother, my great-grandmother, also appears in the film. In a number seven, Went the Day Well. Bizarrely, another great-grandmother of mine appears in this, this time Muriel George, my great-grandmother on my dad's side. She plays the postmistress in a small English village that is taken over by Nazis. This is yet again another British propaganda piece. Based on a story by the fantastic Graham Greene, this was made when the fear of an invasion in Britain was still legitimate. It's a warning to the people of the country to stay vigilant. The highlight of the film is the climax when the members of the village fight back. It's brilliantly brutal. And it's also great to see my great-grandmother kill a Nazi with an axe. In a number six, Yankee Doodle Dandy. Yet another piece of propaganda, this time from the States. Well, I guess there was a rather big war on. This is propaganda to create a sense of pride in being an American. It is a biopic of George M. Cohan the all-American entertainer who was born on July the 4th. Well, he wasn't actually born then though, he was born the day before on July the 3rd, but I guess that doesn't sound as good. It would be like having a horror film called Thursday the 12th. We follow Cohan from a baby to an old man being awarded the Congressional Gold Medal by President Roosevelt in the Oval Office. The music is good, not my sort of music though, and some of the acts look like things that would be rejected on America's Got Talent. James Cagney is the main reason this is on my list. He is fantastic as Cohen. He's charismatic, believable, funny, and one hell of a dancer. He has a really unique and comedic way of dancing. I could watch him tap dance for hours. Here are some other notable releases from 1942 that didn't quite make my list. The Magnificent Ambersons or better known as Orson Welles' difficult second album. Poor big old Orson had his film butchered by RKO. They cut an hour out of his film. 
I've only seen this massively cut down version. So once I see his cut, that could very well go high on my list. They cut it themselves. So they destroyed Ambersons, and the picture itself destroyed me. I was, uh, I didn't get a job as a director for years afterwards. Ah, the French champagne. In terms of propaganda films, Mrs. Miniver won Best Picture at the Oscars. But the bizarrest propaganda would be Disney's short De Führer's Face. You will never hear Donald Duck say Heil Hitler as many times as this. I don't know how the voice artist does that. <laughs> Billy Wilder's first film, The Major and the Minor, has some really funny moments. But the story where Ginger Rogers pretends to be an 11 year old girl and has military students fawn over her and then gets in a romantic relationship with an older man is kind of creepy to watch these days. Hitchcock made Saboteur, the middle part of what I call his madcap thriller trilogy. This, The 39 Steps and North by Northwest are rollicking thrillers that move from set piece to set piece with not much connecting them in between. They got a light tone but a fair amount of violence and they all climax at tourist locations. <laughs> Pride of the Yankees was a by the books biopic of Lou Gehring. The story of the great baseball player who died of ALS. But somehow, that wasn't the most melodramatic film of 1942. That honour belongs to King's Row. This film couldn't be more melodramatic if it tried. You got people dying of disease. <laughs> Suicides and poisoning. Father killed her and committed suicide. And Ronald Reagan losing his legs. Randy! Where's the rest of me? And now back to my top 10. In a number 5, The Talk of the Town, a really funny love triangle comedy. It stars Cary Grant as an outlaw who hides out at a house of an old school friend played by Gene Arthur. Unfortunately, on the same day he gets there, a law professor played by Ronald Coleman is also moving into the house. All three are fantastically funny, but it's Gene Arthur who in particular stands out. She's hilarious in it as the woman desperately trying to make everything look normal. She's brilliantly funny and believable, and shows just why she was one of the top comic stars of the day. Your adenoids trouble you, don't they? Hmm? One thing I always notice is the main theme in it sounds a lot like Yoda's theme from The Empire Strikes Back. Well, would you be willing to accept? John Williams, he got some explaining to do. In a number four, To Be or Not To Be. One of the all-time great comedies. Ernst Lubisch directed this film, and it's a great example for the time. That not all Germans were Nazis, and that also Germans can be funny. Set in Nazi-occupied Warsaw, we follow a troupe of actors who had intended to do a play about the Nazis before the invasion. They use their acting skills, makeup and costumes to help a Polish pilot in a mission to stop Nazi double agents. It's a hilarious look at actors and a humorous look at a nightmarish situation that was ongoing at the time. Everyone is brilliantly funny in it. Especially Jack Benny as an arrogant actor. Where's my moustache? Where's my moustache? This is a catastrophe. We've got to find it. I can't get out of the car without it. I've got to get Maria. Well, what did you do? My moustache. Where did you get Tom Duggan as an actor who disguises himself as Hitler, but isn't particularly confident. Maria! I will... And Carol Lombard as the actress who loves attention. I've seen you in everything you've ever played. I'll never forget how I laughed when I saw you as Kiki. <laughs> Some people thought I was funny. <laughs> but you certainly weren't funny when you played Lady Macbeth. Thank you. Lombard died tragically before the film was released. On her way back from a war bond rally that raised more than $2 million, she, along with her mother, died in a plane crash. 
She was married to Clark Gable at the time of her death. He would go on to act in 27 more films and he remarried twice, but according to Esther Williams, he was never the same again. When he died in 1960, he was buried next to Lombard. In a number three, Cat People. This is a B movie through and through, but a great one. It's one of the most influential horror films of all time. It even invented the jump scare. Telling the story of a Serbian woman living in Manhattan who is terrified of being aroused. For if she is, she will turn into a murdering panther. It's unfortunate for her, but even more unfortunate for her husband. And then the woman who she thinks he is having an affair with. Like most great horror movies, the monster is barely seen, and the use of sounds and images to insinuate the presence of the beast is done expertly. The black and white cinematography is stunning, some of the best of the year. It's scary, sexy, moody, and really silly. Wonderful stuff, an A-star B movie. In a number two, Now Voyager, a brilliant film starring the marvelous Betty Davis, she plays a woman who, due to her controlling mother, is a repressed spinstress. Unattractive, anxious, depressed, big eyebrows, and is on the verge of a nervous breakdown. In comes Claude Rains as a doctor specialising in mental health. With his help and time spent in his sanitarium, she begins to open up, become more confident, and shave her eyebrows. On a cruise around South America, intended to help her become more confident and spend time away from her mother, she has an affair with a married man, who constantly lights two cigarettes in his mouth and gives her one. It's a good thing she came along, as his habit of smoking two cigarettes at once was taking an incredible toll on his health. It's brilliant that she falls in love with a married man, further showing just how complicated life can be. She returns home to live with her mother, showing her that she is no longer someone to be bullied around. Gladys Cooper plays the domineering mother, and yet again, another example of how good the storytelling is here, she isn't played as just some ghastly monster. She's also someone who deeply cares for her daughter. It's based on the novel by Olive Higgins Prouty, a woman who herself had suffered a nervous breakdown after the death of her daughter. Her experience is clearly fed into the novel. And it's great to have a story about people with mental health issues getting help and getting better. A message which has always been important. Now Voyager is a film where nothing is simple, but that doesn't mean it doesn't show life as something that can be full of romance and hope. And in at number one, Casablanca. One of the greatest films of all time. It's one of those movies where everything comes together to create magic. Set in Casablanca in Morocco, most of the action is set at Rick's Café Americain. It could easily have felt like a movie just set on sound stages in Hollywood, but it has such an atmosphere and World War II tension within it. You're never in doubt that you're not in North Africa during the terrible conflict. Rick is played to perfection by Humphrey Bogart, giving possibly his best performance. His world weariness is ideal for the character. When a woman from his past turns up, he is one hell of a decision to make. Try and be with the woman he loves, or try and help her and her new husband, a member of the Czech resistance, to escape the Vichy-controlled country. Playing this love interest is Ingrid Bergman, who is also perfect in it. She shows how a person can be in love with two people at the same time. She shows all the conflict, the love, and the fear to perfection. This film has such a mood and feeling to it. A sense that Rick's bar and Casablanca as a whole is in a sort of limbo, with a cast of lost characters floating around the corrupt city. Claude Rains is magnificent, as is Paul Heinrich, Conrad Veidt, and Peter Lorre. There is genuine tension, genuine romance, and a unique tone that has never been replicated. It's on-screen magic, the sort that comes around from the wonderful collaborative nature of film. Everyone in front of and behind the camera are at the top of their game. It's a stunning film, with so many memorable moments that have been referenced and parodied countless times. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Ooh, best last line of a movie ever. <sighs> I'm definitely coming down with something. Tell her that you've met a lot of dames, but she is really something special. Oh, that she won't believe. Oh, no? I have met a lot of dames, but you are really something special. Really? She bought it. Sam, play our song. 
Just one more time. Of course. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Watch your witch, the wicked witch. Ding dong, the witch uh, is Sam, dead. Sam, Sam, uh, that's enough. Play, uh, play the other one. A truly beautiful story told to perfection. A masterpiece of 40s cinema that has lost none of its power in nearly 80 years. Right, so counting down my top 10. In at number 10, Bambi. In at number 9, There Was a Father. In at number 8, One of Our Aircraft is Missing. In at number 7, Went the Day Well. In at number 6, Yankee Doodle Dandy. In at number 5, The Talk of the Town. In at number 4, To Be or Not to Be. In at number 3, Cat People. In at number 2, now Voyager, and in number one, Casablanca. Well, those are my top ten films of 1942. There's probably loads I've missed out, so what are your favourite films of 1942? Cheers.